Welcome to today's lesson, which is about extension program planning using a logical framework. Program management and planning can be difficult at the best of times. And when the project is one that involves a whole range of partners and agencies, it can be made even more so. So the process of developing a logical framework for a program is a process for developing thorough and clear plans with the involvement of different key partners. The logical framework can help organize the thinking within the program and to guide the purpose with built-in mechanisms for minimizing risks and monitoring, reviewing, and evaluating the way. Complete logical frameworks form the basis of a program plan and can be used as a reference tool for ongoing reporting. The logical framework process works through seven core questions, and I will explain more on these seven core questions. In terms of the lesson objectives, by the end of this unit, you should be able to discuss seven core questions of the logical framework and develop a logical framework to plan for an extension program of your choice. So in order to understand this lesson better, there are key terms you should know, such as evaluation, program evaluation, and logical framework. So as extension experts on your own, you need to think of their meaning. OK. The term program evaluation means different things to different people. To some, it means determining the extent of to which the extension program is achieving the goals it set and the objectives it set out to achieve. But to others, it means judging the merit or worth of a program, whereby a logical framework is a tool for improving the planning, implementation, management, monitoring, and evaluation of the project. It is a way of structuring the main elements in a project and highlighting the logical linkages between them. As a tool for improving the planning, implementation, management, monitoring, and evaluation of the project, there are seven core questions that are considered when developing a logical framework. The first question is, who are we? Whereby we look at who has an interest in the project and who should be involved. The second question is, where are we now? Here, we look at the problems and possibilities. The third question is, where do we want to be? At this stage, it is where the objectives are formulated and other options are considered. On question four, we look at how will we get there, whereby we look at the activities to undertake in order to achieve the objectives which have been formulated. On question number five, we focus on the risks as hindrances to stop us from achieving our formulated objectives and how to manage them. So we ask ourselves, what are the risks and how can we manage them? On the same, we also look at the assumptions. Question number six is, how will we know if you have got there? Here, the focus will be on the milestones and indicators just to know if we are on target. The last question, which is question number seven, is where will we find the evidence that tells us we are on target and or have achieved our objectives? What evidence do we have? Here, the focus will be on the means or sources of verification just to know if the objectives formulated have been achieved. Okay, now let's discuss the seven core questions in detail by starting with the first question, 
u ala wi. Here you need to know the reason why others are involved. Ask yourself, who do I need to involve and undertake a stakeholder analysis? Involving all key partners in the early stages of project planning helps ensure all groups are signed up to the project and on the plan. This can help minimize tensions later on and has the added benefit that is that it pulls knowledge and experience helping to ensure the plan is as robust as possible. In a mat agency project, this early involvement of all key partners is vital as effective engagement is likely to result in improved effectiveness of the project because there is likely to be a greater sense of ownership and agreement of the processes to achieve an objective. Dispositiveness is enhanced, effort and e inputs are more likely to be targeted on perceived needs so that outputs from the project are used appropriately. Effective engagement of key partners at the early stages also result in improved efficiency. In other words, project inputs and activities are more likely to result in outputs on time of good quality and within budget if local knowledge and skills are tapped into and mistakes are avoided. Effective engagement issues improve sustainability and sustainable impact as more people are committed to carrying on the activity after outside support has stopped because there is ownership and active participation has helped develop skills and confidence among people and maintain infrastructure for the long term. There is improved transparency and accountability if more and more stakeholders are given information and decision-making power. Take note that participation can have some simple but very important benefits, but it is not a guarantee of success. It's not obvious that because partner A, for example, has participated and the project registers success. No, it's not like that. Achieving participation is not easy as there will be conflict, conflicting interests that come to the surface and managing conflict is likely to be an essential skill. Participation can sometimes be time consuming if many players are involved. You know, where there is a group of people, it's very difficult and challenging to come up with a consensus on a simple issue. And it can be painful if it involves a change in practice, for example, in the way institutions have always done things. Waking out who needs to be involved and what their inputs or interest is likely to be needs to be done as early as possible, but should not be repeated in the later stages of the project just to assess whether, whether the original situation has changed and whether the involvement of groups is being adequately addressed. After knowing the reason as to why others are involved, the next step on the same is to know who do I need to involve. Analyzing the stakeholders who need to be involved is one of the most crucial elements of any mad agency project planning. Stakeholder analysis is a useful tool or process for 
identifying stakeholder groups and describing the nature of their stake roles and interests. Doing a stakeholder analysis, analysis can help us to identify who do we who we believe should be encouraged and help to participate in the project. Identify winners and losers, those with rights, interests, resources, skills, and abilities to take part or influence the course of a project. Improve the project sensitivity to perceived needs of those affected. Helps to reduce or hopefully remove negative impacts on vulnerable and disadvantaged groups. Enable useful alliances which can build which can be built upon, identify, and reduce these things. For example, identifying areas of possible conflicts of interest and expectation between different stakeholders so that little conflict is avoided before it happens. Stakeholder analysis needs to be done with a variety of stakeholders to explore perceptions and verify them by cross-reference. Some potential groups you may want to consider include user groups. Uh, these are people who use the resources or services in an area. We have the interest groups as people who have an interest in or opinion about who can affect the use of a resource or service, the winners and losers, the beneficiaries, intermediaries and those involved in and excluded from the decision making process. Another useful way of thinking about stakeholders is to divide them into primary stakeholders, key stakeholders and secondary stakeholders. <coughs> primary stakeholders are generally the vulnerable. They are the reason why the project is being planned. They are those who benefit from from or are adversely affected by the project. They are highly dependent on a resource or service <coughs> or area for their well-being. For example, pigeon peace smallholder farmers, usually they live in or very near the area in question. They often have few options when faced with change, so they may have difficult adapting. Key stakeholders are those who are really important in what the project is trying to deliver or achieve. And secondary stakeholders include other people and institutions with a stake or interest or intermediary law in the resources or area being considered. But being secondary does not mean they are not important stakeholders. Some secondary stakeholders may be vital as means to meeting the interests of the primary stakeholders. So when undertaking a stakeholder analysis, there are many different tools to help us to think about our stakeholders. Which tools to use depends upon the questions that need to be addressed. So I will give an example on the step, steps to follow when doing stakeholder analysis, but this is not the only way of doing it. The first step is to list all possible stakeholders, that is all those who are affected by the project or can influence it in any way. When listing, Avoid using words like the community or the village, but be more specific. For example, sweet potato, smallholder farmers. The second step is to identify each stakeholder's interest that is both hidden or open in relation to the potential project. Because some stakeholders may have several interests, so it is good to identify them. The third step is to consider the positive or negative impact of the project on the identified stakeholders. The next step is to consider how much do we value the interests of each stakeholder. 
a high priority of a high priority of interest means the project is being designed in the interest of that stakeholder for their benefit so there is a need to rank stakeholders with those with a high priority at the top and low priority at the bottom the next step is to consider how much influence each stakeholder has here you need to put each stakeholder into a stakeholder matrix according to the priority of interest and level of influence. See stakeholder classification, interest or influence matrix in your notes. The interest influence matrix gives you some guide as to how your project should work with each. The last step, which is the sixth step, is to decide when you need to engage with the stakeholder groups and at what level. Remember, you cannot work with all groups at all the time, as complete participation can lead to participatory paralysis. The Second question to discuss is where are we now? This is where the problems and possibilities are identified. The first step, who are we, has helped us to identify who needs to be involved, how and when in the initial design phase of the project. With the right stakeholders on board, the focus now tends to analyzing the situation and prioritizing the way forward through situation and option analysis to help us to understand the current circumstances and develop possible choices for the future. The purpose of these activities is to develop a relationship of mutual respects and agreement between key stakeholders and to reach a position of collective understanding of the underlying issues and problems so that they can move into the next stage. There is no right way to do this, and there is a number of options for working through the process. You should judge for yourself the best route to fit the context. Ideally, this stage should include some analysis of previous research or evaluation material, potential documents that have led you to this stage or examples from other organizations. There may also be notes from earlier meetings that may inform the process. The exercise usually needs to be repeated with different stakeholder groups, often very different pictures of the situation image. Developing a problem tree is one way of doing problem analysis, and this involves mapping the focal problem against its causes and effects. See the problem tree figure in your notes. So depending on the group or the situation, there are two methods for developing a problem tree. Method one is brainstorming. This method can be more creative, but it is risky because just because you can get tangled up. In this method, participants brainstorm issues around a problem as yet unidentified. Each issue is recorded separately. Here, you are not supposed to stop, think or question, just scatter the post it's on the flip chart. When ideas or issues dry up, that's when you can stop. After that, you need to identify and agree on the focal problem. It's probably on the flip chart, but may just need rewording, so you can do the rewording. 
take note that a problem is not the absence of a solution but an existing negative state after the focal problem has been identified sort the remaining issues into causes and effects of the problem then cluster the issues into smaller subgroups of causes and effects building the tree in the process tear up reward and add post it as you proceed you can finish by drawing connecting lines to show the cause and effect relationships the second method of developing a problem tree is by using a systematic method in this method participants first debate and agree the focal problem so you need to write this on a post it and place it in the middle of the flip chart now develop the direct causes the first level below the focal problem by asking but why then continue with second third and fourth level causes each time asking but why repeat for the effects above the focal problem instead asking so what then draw connecting lines to show the relationships you can see an example of a problem tree in your notes the yeah the third question to consider when developing a logical framework is where do we want to be at this stage it is where the objectives are formulated an objective or vision tree is developed and other options are considered so having defined the problem that we are trying to tackle we now need to develop this into objectives that can that we can work towards some facilitators and participants prefer to skip the problem tree and move directly on to an objectives or vision tree instead of looking back looking forward rather than thinking in terms of negatives participants imagine a desired situation in the future this focal objective is placed in the center of the flip chart what is needed to achieve that situation is placed below the focal objective what would result from achieving the situation is placed above going directly to an objective tree can be particularly useful in a post-conflict context where participants find analysis of the problem painful developing an objective or vision tree can be done by reformulating the elements of our problem tree into positive desirable conditions essentially the focal problem is now turned over to become the key objective for addressing the problem we have identified in logical framework terms it may be the goal or purpose for example the problem of low Chalimbana and CG7 groundnut yield becomes an objective of high Chalimbana and CG7 groundnut yield. Below the focal problem, you can continue this reversing for each of the causes listed to create further objectives. Above, if the problem is addressed, one would expect to see changes in the effects so there will be useful ideas here for potential indicators of progress and identification of the benefits to be achieved in your notes there is an objective tree diagram so you can refer to that after a number of objectives have been identified the group needs to decide 
on which ones to focus on. This is called options analysis. The group should agree on the criteria for assessing the various options by looking at the key factors such as the degree of fit with macro objectives, what other stakeholders are doing, the experience and comparative advantage of your organization and partners, what are the expected benefits and to whom, what is the feasibility and probability of success, risks and assumptions, who is carrying the risk, social criteria such as costs and benefits, gender issues, talk of social cultural constraints, who carries social costs, issues to do with the environment, technical, institutional, economic, and the financial, such as cash flows and financial sustainability. So when the criteria have been set, a decision as to which option to take can follow. Sometimes it is possible to link the chosen, chosen option from the objectives tree into the first objectives column of the log frame as shown in your notes that is mode 2 page 52. The fourth question is how will we get there? Having defined our problem, we now need to set our objectives. We can take our objective straight from our problem tree, or we can work through a simple step-by-step -step approach. Step one, we need to define the goal, whereby a goal is a higher order objective or a longer term of outcome that the specific objective we contribute to. It can be defined as the overall big picture need or problem being addressed. For example, high chalimbana and CG7 groundnut yield. Step two, we need to define the purpose. The purpose describes the specific and immediate outcomes of the project. This is identified by work to articulate which problem the project is there to address using a problem tree. The purpose needs to be clearly defined so that all st key stakeholders know what the project is trying to achieve. For example, enhanced knowledge on recommended husbandry practices. Step three, we need to describe the outputs. The outputs describe what the project will have delivered by the end. And these are the results that the project must deliver. They can be thought as being the terms of reference for the project. For example, adequate extension services and better quality extension services. The task on step four is to define the activities. The activities describe what will be done to achieve each output described in step number three. An example can be train both old and new lead farmers, and another one can be distribute governors, husband practices manuals to lead farmers. Step number five is to test the logic. When the objectives hierarchy is read, is read from the bottom up, it can be expressed in terms of if we do these activities, then this output will be achieved. If we deliver these outputs, then this purpose will be achieved. And if the purpose is achieved, then this will contribute to the goal. The 
objectives that is goal, outcome, outputs and activities are put into the first column of the logical framework also known as the objectives column see examples in your notes on question five what can we stop us from getting there we focus on the risks and how to manage them so we ask ourselves what are the risk what are the risks and how can we manage them on the same we also look at the assumptions risk is the potential for unwanted happenings impairing the achievement of our objectives and every project involves risks we all understand that risk assessment and management are important elements in business likewise involvement and committee work if you talk to experienced development or community workers they will usually agree that when projects fail it is not generally because the objectives were wrong but because insufficient time and thought were given to the risk factors to what can go along with the plan and to what are the assumptions that are being made so it is important that risks are identified in planning and that a risk management plan is built on top the into the overall design process and implementation management so when undertaking a risk analysis the first step is to identify the risks creatively think up as many risks as you can examine the various analysis you may have done for example stakeholder economic environmental as well as social problem this will usually give many clues see the left hand column of example 3a in your notes the second step is to number of each risk on your list estimate and evaluate each risk against the two characteristics of probability that is the likelihood that it will happen and impact or the effect of the risk step number three where possible design measures to reduce or eliminate the risk this is especially important for risks called medium or high this is not applicable to risks with low score because some risks are controllable and others are not going ahead with a project with risks calling medium will need strong justification in step number four you need to return to your objectives here you need to redesign your activities or outputs in the light of the risk analysis to incorporate measures to reduce or eliminate the probability or impact of significant risks in managing the risks make sure that your risk analysis should highlight the risks that you need to manage you may be willing to ignore those with a low probability and low impact however those with a high probability or greater potential impact must be managed and it is a must part of the management of risks is the initial identification of them so if you know there are risks you can look out for them and 
monitor them. There may also be other ways of managing them through thorough planning, resourcing, or controlling them. It may be that if there is a risk with a high probability and high impact that cannot be managed or minimized, you might want to consider the feasibility of the project. Yeah, because it may be that the risk of doing the work is greater than the risk of doing it. See example 3B in your notes, that is mod 2, page 59. On the same assumptions are an expressed statement of factors which will have an influence on the achievement of the project objectives and therefore need to be managed. These assumptions need to be integrated earlier on in the project. By adding in assumptions, our logic is extended so that once activities have been carried out and if the assumptions at this level hold true, outputs will be delivered. Once outputs and assumptions at this level are fulfilled, the project purpose will be achieved. And once the purpose has been achieved and the assumptions at this level are fulfilled, the contribution to the achievement of the overall goal will have been made by the project. Once, yeah, once the assumptions have been identified, they should be added into the logical framework. See examples on page 60 and 61 of mode 2 for further clarification. Question number six is how will we know if you have got there? Here, the focus will be on the milestones and indicators just to know if we are on target. Once the project objectives and assumptions have been, have been drafted, the next task is to identify indicators for each of the objectives that might be able to measure and report on the achievement of the objectives. So for each horizontal layer of the log frame, you need to define indicators that can be measured to show the project is achieving what it set out to do. The simplest way of setting usable indicators is to use the maxim QQT, whereby QQT stands for quality, quantity, quality, and time. So the first step is to set the basic indicator. Then in step number two, add quantity, which is an amount or percentage that will be achieved. In step three, add quality. This built-in quality measure to specify the indicator. And in step four, add time. This indicates when this should be done. Here, you need to avoid using general phrases such as as soon as possible. So step one basic indicator can be lead farmers perform their duties. When quantity is added, it can read 90% of the lead farmers perform their duties. When quality is added in step three, it can read 90% of the lead farmers perform their duties competently. And when time is added in step four, it can read 90% of the lead farmers perform their duties competently by the second growing season. You can also check for another example on page 65 
mode two. The last question, which is question number seven, is how do we prove it? Here, the focus will be on the means or sources of verification, just to know if the objectives formulated have been achieved. This is the final element of developing the logical framework and a vital stage of the initial planning that is often overlooked. So building in everyday sources at this stage will make the monitoring and evaluating of the project easier. Column three of the log from in your notes in your notes relates to the verification and it should be considered at the same time as you formulate your indicators. Check the table on page 67, mode 2. In specifying our means or sources of verification, we need to ask a series of simple questions as such as what evidence do we need where will the evidence be located? How are we going, going to collect it? Is it available from existing sources? For example, progress reports, records, talk of accounts, statistics, and many more sources. Is special data gathering required? Yeah, is special data gathering required? Who is going to collect it, who will pay for its collection, when or how regularly it should be provided, is it monthly, quarterly, or annually, how much data gathering is worthwhile, some typical sources of verification, the minutes of meetings, attendance lists, service reports, project records, as well as reports. So you need to be careful not to commit yourself to measuring things that will be very expensive and time consuming to measure. All quantitative indicators should be easily measurable. Go back if the indicators you have chosen are impractical to measure. Here you need to be more practical. For further understanding, see the table on page 69. Thank you for your attention.